Hi, I'm Faye Lynn. I'm Michael K. Potter. We are the co-creators, co-writers, co-directors, co-producers of Upstaged, the series. You can find us at www.upstagedseries.com. Support our Kickstarter live now. Find it through our website in our fundraising tab. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by two very talented individuals. I have just happened to upon their series, Upstage. I'm also interviewing them for another reason. They are proponents of the arts community of the Windsor-Essex County region. I happen to be also working on this particular series, so I'm not biased whatsoever, 100%, not so, nothing whatsoever. It's going to be great for Windsor Essex County. It's going to be a wonderful series that everyone should definitely support because of a current Kickstarter campaign, because we're joined by the ever-talented Michael K. Potter and Faye Lynn. How are you both doing today? Super. Yeah, good. Tip top. (laughs) How are you, Kurt? I'm doing okay. This is something that I'm glad I'm a part of because the Windsor Essex County area has been a proponent for the arts community for a long time, but they don't promote it very well. And I'm glad to see that you both are doing this particular series in Windsor Essex County. And for those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. I'm Michael Potter. Thalian, we're the uh, co-creators and co-writers and executive producers and directors, and we're also acting uh, in Upstaged, which is an eight-episode comedy series that we're shooting this summer, summer of 2024 in uh, Windsor, Ontario. It's loosely based on our own company, uh, Post Productions, which is a theater, a regional independent theater company, and our venue, the Shadowbox Theater, which are in Windsor, and we even play fictional versions of ourselves in it. It's kind of about the situation that the arts face uh, in the the post-COVID economy, which is for two years or so, people got used to staying at home. And then when things started reopening, a lot of people continued to stay at home. And so companies like ours that offer live entertainment are struggling. And so in the series, we're struggling to the point where we actually agree, despite the fact that we hate the idea, to allow a documentary crew to come in and film our process as we go from the very beginning, first pre-production meeting, all the way through auditions, rehearsals, set building, costuming, all the things the audience normally wouldn't see in theater, all the way up to the opening night of the play that we're working on. And that's sort of the arc of the whole series. For people who aren't in theater, it'll be kind of illuminating. But really, it's it's not about theater per se. That just happens to be the artistic world we're living in. It's about artists and other people who, I'm sure like, like you, Kurt, put a lot of time and effort and money and um, sweat and tears and often blood cut ourselves um, into what they're passionate about. And, you know, artists are passionate about creating whatever it is that they create. And often to outsiders, it seems like there's something seriously wrong with artists because, you know, especially in a place like Windsor, where the idea of artists being paid for the work isn't normalized, it feels like you're putting in full-time hours or more for nothing. It for seems exposure. bizarre. Yeah, it seems bizarre to people who don't do it. And that's kind of the sort of people that the series is about. We saw someone um, from Windsor posting about the arts the other day and comparing it to like, chefs can love to cook, but no one expects them to do it for free in a professional environment. It's that. It's like artists can love what they do. They can be driven by the passion of what they do. But there is kind of an expectation that they'll do it for um, little to nothing. Mm-hmm. That paying an artist means tossing them 50 bucks for 50 it's hours of work. Charity. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, you should be grateful. And, and people are always trying to bargain down. And it's like, if we made minimum wage, it would be you know, exponentially more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I guess that's a huge part of it because that's part of sort of the background, the economic background of the series, which I think is going to resonate with a lot of people in a lot of different industries and cities all over the world. But, I mean, ultimately, well, like most of the comedy that we like, it's about 
human beings, human beings who are odd in some way, because that those are the humans that we like because we're odd, awkward, odd people. And there's a lot of those in the arts, including <laughs> us and the relationships between them, the sheer diversity and variety of human beings who are involved in that kind of life and how they relate to each other and how very different people, very different personalities, beliefs, values come together to make sure that something wonderful is created out of almost nothing. Completely understand and agree. And if I hadn't have gone back to university and taken fine arts, I probably wouldn't have understood what you were talking about, but I've seen those eccentric, wonderful people uh, <laughs> in the arts community, whether it's from a fine art perspective or from a drama perspective or whatever the case may be. And yeah. looking at Upstage, it's a comedy, it's a mockumentary. What type of comedy does this embody? You start. <laughs> <laughs> it's character-based comedy, fundamentally. Um, that's what I like. It's what I like best in terms of storytelling generally. And I'm, I've been a student of storytelling for almost 30 years now in various genres, various media. I love analyzing story structure, why things work, why things don't work, especially comedy. The stories that I think have the longest lives and resonate the most with people are stories that are about human beings making choices and having to deal with the consequences of those choices. So ultimately, that's the kind of comedy that is. I also think that's the basis of a great drama. I mean, that's why Breaking Bad works so well, for instance. Mm. It's a series of choices and horrible consequences. And then you have to make new choices because of them. It's fundamentally about that. But, you know, we include as pretty much as, as many kinds of humor as possible. We've got irony and wit and satire and spoof and Pratt falls. Uh, there's a character who vomits whenever he's nervous. You know, we've got pretty much everything in the kitchen sink in there on this bedrock of human beings making choices and dealing with consequences. The writer's room that we had, I mean, we all kind of come from different styles and aesthetics of comedy. And so we would each put our own thing in there. And the trick of it was that if it didn't make us laugh, it was gone. Yeah. We weren't going to be practiced about good. it. Like, no, but this joke, if you have to explain the joke, it doesn't work. Yeah. Get rid of it. We were pretty hardcore about that rule. We were. So <laughs> there was a lot of like, you know, quick back and forth that came from one of the writers and a lot of uh, visual comedy that came from another writer. Some more ludicrous things which work because the series itself is very grounded. We actually just finished Marathon and Curb Your Enthusiasm, nice. which we hadn't seen when we wrote the series. And we're like, oh. There's our style. There, yeah. There's some of that right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Comedically, in terms of the comedic style, the big influences are the movies of Christopher Guest and really influential on, on me and, and Faye as well, I think. You know, going back to Spinal Tap all the way to his mascots, his newest. I can't remember what his newest is. His particular way of creating mockumentaries since the mid 80s has been super influential on me and then also the tv work of uh, ricky gervais i guess the common thread here is this is we have a very british style of humor gervais i think is really the master at cringe comedy about mining comedy out of putting people in an awkward situation and then watching them squirm <laughs> and trying to get out of it and making the audience both you know, laugh at them, but also feel for them at the same time. There's no one who does that better than than him. Yeah, I think awkward people behaving awkwardly and <laughs> incompetent people behaving confidently hmm. is very, um, it's very funny to us. Yeah. So, yeah, no one. <laughs> and maybe it's because we identify, I don't so know. So much, so much. <laughs> You know, we're inspired by the things that we find funny. So in terms of TV shows, the original Office, especially for me, the UK version, Extras, also by Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant, really into Arrested Development, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Archer. So all those have some influence on how I approach humor. And then for movies, it's like, I love the Christopher Guest movies, but I also like really, some really broad comedy, like Airplane. I think Airplane's funniest things ever made the naked gun yeah there was a good period for comedies late 2000s early 2010s you know the other guys really liked that one melissa mccarthy and Kristen wig did some great stuff in that period i'm really big fans of them i'm a huge stand-up fan too comedy writers david sidaris uh i went through a huge david sidaris phase but actually you know i don't read a lot of comedy though mostly my reading all my life has been 
well, until recently, horror, sci-fi, fantasy, comics. I had a huge comic collection, which became useless to me when I became blind. But my son inherited it, for better or worse. He tells me there's no way he'll ever own a place large enough to store it. <laughs> well, that's his problem, not mine. I don't know what you How many influences? Well, I grew up on Kids in the Hall and Monty oh. Oh, and yeah. oh yeah and then you know mad tv and saturday night live yep. in syndication so i grew up on a lot of that style of comedy so that's very deeply integrated into me uh chris i love his films and i love anything that takes the real and makes it almost a little surreal mm -hmm. a little surreal mm -hmm. because it's so i don't know there's something a little off kilter about it of course i love the office mm -hmm. Parks and Recreation, some of these um, strong female comedians that are mm -hmm. coming out, like mm -hmm. Melissa McCarthy and yeah. Amy Poehler. Oh, my goodness. Christine Baranski. She's always awesome whenever she appears in anything. Joan Cusack. Oh, I'm really always awesome. excited to see Joan Cusack in anything. Hey, OG, Carol Brunette. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's idol. Yeah. Her and Catherine O'Hara. Yeah. Love, love yeah. them. Schitt's Creek was our first, our first COVID show. Yeah. The pandemic hit and Schitt's Creek had just ended. So I actually don't know how that timeline, because you know, the pandemic lasted 10 years. Schitt's Creek was a delight, an absolute delight. Yeah. That just comes with the territory in general. You get a bunch of creative people, you're going to always have, it's not even the oddball situation or the awkwardness of it because everyone's awkward in their own way. So if you can find humor in, in people in general, I think that's just yeah. great to see. And the fact well, that you're highlighting it here is even better. And that's a good point, right? That is that everyone's awkward in their own way. And when you get to know people and they open up about their own awkwardness, you know, I'm old, but I'm still I'm still surprised every time someone opens up about that. And I think, well, oh, you don't seem awkward to me at all, right? <laughs> but inside, we, we feel these things, right? And that's, I think it's almost universal that we all find ourselves in situations where we feel awkward, mm -hmm. even though the, the people around us might not realize. Have you ever wonder about that? Have you ever seen someone trip on the street and they don't know if anyone's watching, but they pretend they did it on purpose or <laughs> oh, I was trying to tie my shoe? Yeah, just yeah. that trying to get by and pretend you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and we don't. None of us do. And so there's also a Canadian element of, you know, this this feeling of inadequacy and constantly having to apologize, right? You know, like I'm the sort of person, if I knock over a chair, I apologize to the chair, right? That makes no sense. It's completely irrational, but I, I still do it. And then afterwards, I'm like, what? Why, why did you do that? Because it's it, in my blood. Summary, people are weird and people are funny. And we have spent our the entirety of our careers studying people and embodying people because that's what we do as performers. Yeah. So here we just kind of shove that into a series. Well, the fact that you have an eight episode arc is perfect for this style of television only because that's what people are used to now. When yeah. we grew up watching TV series, 24 episodes was kind of the standard norm. Now that we have shorter amount of episodes, but a longer amount of time per episode, is kind yeah. of now the standard format only because people are binging so much content at a, such a fast rate. How do you set yourself apart from the series that are on like a Netflix? Yeah, and it's a British model. I mean, that model has been around in Britain for a long time. Not all British TV follows that model, but a lot of it has. And a lot of my favorite series are like that, where they have set themselves a definite target instead of trying to fill whatever the network tells them their order is right and i think you just generally get better work that way because you don't end up with filler episodes it's the same with long form podcasts mm -hmm. like when that became a thing where you could really delve into yeah. an interview with someone because those strict regulations were taken away mm -hmm. you know if the conversation was 45 minutes if it was two hours you could really dig into that content so yeah we're less restricted and yes. more freedom to tell a story and tell it the way you want it told sorry i'm blind right so yeah. now now that i've declined the call it has to babble to me about it for a while it's done <laughs> that's okay in regards to having a disability of being blind and then writing this series i hate to use the term disabled i like the term disabled disabled people don't mind the term disabled okay sorry how do you plan to include both able and disabled bodies of people in this particular series well i mean to me it's a no-brainer because that's society um in a way in a way what we wanted in terms of characters in the show were people who were funny who had personalities that tended toward one extreme or another, 
um, but had complexity and depth and nuance and that felt real. And part of that's the writing, part of that's the acting. And part of that diversity is, you know, racial, it's, you know, ethnic, it's, um, you know, sexuality, gender, all these other, you know, these categories. And there's been a lot of progress um, in media when it comes to diversity and representation of people who aren't just white and cis and hetero. But we still haven't really addressed the disabled issue as a culture, as a society. And I mean that bro more broadly than Canada. I mean that internationally. It's still okay to ignore disabled people. It's not seen as much of, as much of a problem. And when disabled people are included in things, it's usually, you usually have two options, right? They're there as objects of pity so that you can manipulate people into feeling sorry for someone and therefore feeling better about themselves. Oh, well, you know, at least I'm not as bad off as that person, right? I can't even tell you how many people have told me since, you know, I'm a blind cripple, I'm a blind double amputee. And uh, how many people have told me in various uh, ways over the last few years since I became disabled, how basically they they couldn't live if they were like me, that they would kill themselves, you know? So that's oh, that's sorry. one of the extremes. And then the other one, which I hate as much and, and pretty much all disabled people that I've ever interacted with despise is to treat them as objects of inspiration. So we exist to inspire, right? Oh, well, you know, you'll have advertising campaigns featuring someone with a disability um, making cookies. And that's supposed to be inspirational because look, he can do what a five-year-old can do, right? Things like that. And people think they're complimenting you where they tell you, oh, you're so inspiring. But the flip side of that is when you're not inspiring, nobody wants to be around you because now you remind them of how vulnerable they are and what, what, what awaits them in their future. Because the truth is, unless we die in a horrible accident when we're young, we're going to become disabled. Pretty much everyone does at some point in their lives. So the people who are disabled people generally are those who are not senior citizens. We don't talk about senior citizens as much as disabled people because we just accept, well, they should be disabled. Mm -hmm. But so part of it is accepting that disabled people are just human beings with the same complexities as anyone else. And that means writing disabled characters who aren't objects of pity and who aren't objects of inspiration. They're subjects, they're humans who have their own goals and their own fears, who screw things up, who make mistakes, who are sometimes just jerks, um, who have bad days and don't want to be your object of inspiration today, F off. And, <laughs> and all of this, right? Uh, all this complexity that other characters who aren't disabled are allowed to have. Uh, but disabled characters tend not to be allowed to have. There's been some progress on this front. Um, Michelle Lovretta with Killjoys did a really great job, including disabled um, actors and uh, and having disabled characters in that show. And I was in that show for a couple episodes. And then actually Larry David in Curb Your Enthusiasm. He has a whole bunch of uh, people with different kinds of disabilities in that show. And they're allowed to be funny. They're allowed to be people. Mm. You can laugh at things that they do without thinking, oh, is this offensive? I'm supposed to be inspired, right? One of the ways that we normalize disabled characters in upstage is just by treating them like everyone else. And that means, you know, sometimes there are jokes, you know, about the fact that I'm blind or the fact that I have two prosthetic legs. There's an episode where I put the wrong leg, the wrong leg on the wrong stump, right? I'm wearing the legs on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. And I don't notice. And uh, another character has to point it out, right? Things like that. Because I find it funny, right? I find it funny when things like that happen to me. There's stuff that happens to me. Oh, for instance, I'm constantly talking to myself because I don't know when people leave the room. I'll be in mid-conversation. People will wander off. I don't know. I keep talking and then I'm like, hello? <laughs> and I laugh because it's funny, right? So we can recognize that without dehumanizing the disabled person and to to treat them as though you have to be, touch them with kid gloves and that you're only allowed to present them in these very limited ways is dehumanizing you know if i'm not allowed to laugh about my blindness um that dehumanizes me right i can laugh about the fact that i have a squishy potato body nobody cares about that right that i'm so completely unfit <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not laughing about my blindness. Come on, <laughs> right? 
I'm a potato with pipe cleaner limbs. I mean, that's how I play it. And I'm okay. It's okay for me to talk about that. But I can't talk about the fact that, you know, I walk into walls. Come on. Well, <laughs> <laughs> if you think about the kinds of humor that have been around for a while where we can, you know, poke fun at somebody's big birthmark, right? Mm -hmm. But they happen to be blind. It's like, oh, can't touch that territory. You know, in some ways, let's touch that territory. <laughs> I was so happy in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Larry David had this blind character who was a complete asshole. <laughs> Just a complete asshole. He uses people all the time. He uses Larry and his friend to do all of this moving for him mm -hmm. and pretends that he can't do anything. He, could, he totally just uses it, his disability as a way to manipulate other people. And he's also super, completely superficial. So he wants to dump his girlfriend because he found out that she wasn't as hot as he thought she was. <laughs> right? And why does this matter to you? You can't see her anyway, but he's so superficial. It matters to you, even though he can't see her. Okay. Stuff like that, that is progress to me. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have to rewatch that curb then. It's been a while since I've seen it. So, you know, how does Upstaged plan to highlight the Windsor Essex County community? Well, it is a very kind of homegrown feel. You know, it takes place in Windsor. Uh, we're going to be shooting mostly at the Shadowbox Theater because, well, we have the venue and it's what the series is about. Um, but we're also featuring, you know, parks and there are several local businesses that we'll be going to. Those have yet to be decided, big news in, in that regard, but um, at least seven locations that way. And we really want to highlight, there is a, a beauty in Windsor. Windsor is a really beautiful place. And just to have that on a screen for the world to access, mm -hmm. our riverfront, mm -hmm. oh, oh my goodness. I mean, even our downtown, this- The people. The people, I mean, and this strange mentality we all have. I grew up, I grew up in this area. I am like, right. I was uh, an Amherstburgonian for mm -hmm. most of my life and then moved to Windsor. And we have this mentality of like, you can't be too proud of yourself. You know, it's like, I did something I'm proud of, but uh, but it's but I'm sure that other people could do it better. That's it's a little ludicrous to me. Yeah, it's yeah. it's an odd self-deprecating charm that we have, and I think that that's sort of built into the tone of the whole series. It's yeah. like this is who we are and where we're from. And sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm from here. But in that way, that you can see as an outsider, as all the outsiders I've ever met, that say, um you know, you don't have to apologize. Like I'm an outsider. I'm not from Windsor. Mm. So I love Windsor. And most people I know who aren't from Windsor, who live here, love Windsor, right? Like yeah. we came here and we chose to stay because we've been other places. We've lived other places. And so we appreciate how great this city and this region mm -hmm. is. You know, when I first was moving to Windsor, I came by train and it got picked up by a cab. And so I got talking with the cab driver he asked, you know, what I was doing down here. And I said, well, you know, I just got hired here. I'm I'm scouting out places to live, and I, you know, for my son and I. And he tried to talk me out of moving to Windsor. <laughs> the cab driver, my very first time coming to Windsor to look for a place to live, tried to talk me out of moving to Windsor. I was like, what? What are you, what are you doing? So, but, but there's so much to be proud of here. And yeah. part of it is people are a big part, locations, like face it, but also... There's a culture here that I find really interesting. It has issues, you know, um, some of which we're trying to address in the series, but it has a lot of great things about it too. There's an openness to the culture here that I really like. Yeah. And then there's also a lot of just really cool, not just in the arts, but really cool businesses, right? And brands and entrepreneurs yes. and leaders of various kinds. We're keeping the series hyper-local. So we're really featuring, like we're looking for local businesses to feature in episodes. We're looking for local businesses to sponsor, use their products in episodes on mm -hmm. film and to uh, partner with us in various ways for merch and so forth. You know, we're trying to make things like on-set catering and all of this hyper-local yeah. and feature as much of Windsor in various ways as possible, not just in terms of location, but in terms of brands, personalities, culture, everything. And of course, that extends to the talent. The cast is 98% people from Windsor-Essex because there's so many talented oh, actors uh, in this region. 
And the crew is all uh, Windsor Essex, the production team, everything. So it was meant from the very beginning when we wrote it in 2021 to be a way to showcase Windsor. We wanted to make sure it was made in Windsor by Windsor. We want people to be curious about Windsor, yeah. to want to come here and see these things that they saw on the screen because yeah. Windsor is a very curious place. It's a weird little place. I can say that because I'm from here. If it wasn't weird, I'd probably find it boring. Yeah, if it wasn't weird, it wouldn't be interesting. <laughs> and, and it is. Windsor is an interesting place in so many varieties. So uh, we really want to want to push that to the yeah. forefront. There's nothing more off-putting to me than normalcy. Thank you. As a fellow Windsorite as well for, for many, many years, um, I can second phase statements quite clearly, being that I actually grew up on Howard for most of my life so quite literally just down the road from you guys there so wow. i know all about the strangeness of of windsor especially in central windsor of all places but charming little pockets of places yes. but that's what makes like the quirkiness of the city of windsor is rather interesting but the fact that it has such a vibrant batch of communities all throughout the city itself there's not just one central pocket yeah. of amazing quirkiness yeah. or creative people they are all over the city and the yeah. fact that you have this particular series showcasing that the fact that you have I mean, 98% talent specifically, because I was going to ask about the talent. You know, talk about the casting process of Upstage, because I think that's really important to show that you don't have to move to Toronto to get hired for creative film yeah. and television works in Windsor. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the goal. That's, you want to talk about the, the casting process? The casting yeah. process was <laughs> madness. It was amazing. Uh, it was terrifying. It was a lot. So Post Productions is basically a mom and pop shop. It's Michael and I. We we run the thing. And we're used to, like, we've cast a lot of productions on stage, mostly. 37 or something. Something like that. I lost a lot. And we're used to, you know, a handful of people turn out, maybe a good amount of people turn out, but we're not even getting into, like, you know, 30 people turn out. That's incredible because our shows are very small. So here we were casting, we put the call out for 39 characters. Um, there are more than that in the series. And we received close to 100 audition tapes. We thought we'd have to beg people. We thought, okay, 20 yeah. of our friends are going to say they're interested. 10 will actually follow through. And then we'll have to make calls and call in favors. And we're going to have to accept whoever shows well, up. And so <laughs> we get this onslaught and Fusion Talent Agency alone uh, talent agency a lot of our people came from them and they have been just just incredible we spent a month watching the tapes discussing the tapes pairing up who might be good at what characters sending out emails so many emails and then preparing scheduling sides. preparing sides uh we bought a new printer because of this <laughs> series i'm very excited about that though we got a great deal um <laughs> But we bought a new printer just so we could print outsides and print out info packages. And it was nine days of in-person callbacks. Oh, and for every character, we had multiple actors to choose from. So we were all great. We like, were all. Yeah. Oh, like any one of them we could have chosen and they would have been great. That was a pretty cool position to be it in. It was. It meant we had to say no to a lot of really great people too. Which it is, hurt. Which always sucks, right? But great to, to see so many different interpretations of the same characters yeah. and see, okay, so if we choose this one and we pair that person up with this person over here, would that combination work? Or do we have to try a different person in this role, you know? really trying yeah. to understand the relationships and the believability of people relative to each other and also scheduling we're on a very mm -hmm. tight efficient schedule here and it's like well these two people would be great together but they can never be in the same room i mean we're artists in windsor ontario we all have other jobs we're artists in canada yeah. and well most of us have other jobs so if they can't be in the same room together, then that that helped the choice. But it was a difficult decision. But I will say what was so rewarding. I mean, I can't even think of a single person we had where we were just like, oh, my God, who does this meh, um, awful there? No, is that they were really excited about the material mm -hmm. that we wrote this thing. We started writing this thing three years ago. First drafts were written in between June and September 21. Yeah. And 21. yeah. And to hear, hear it come out in fresh voices, the people that actually found it funny and, and got it and found it heartwarming because um, some of the series is it's very, it's very human. So you get pathos too. That was, it was just an incredible feeling. So rewarding, exhausting, 
<laughs> um, difficult, exciting, all yeah. of the things. Yeah. 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 And, you know, Windsor is really lucky. One of the ways that Windsor is really fortunate is that for a city of its size, it's not a huge city, but disproportionately strong arts community and in all the various arts disciplines, including filmmaking. There are a lot of people who don't even realize films are being made in Windsor. Mm -hmm. And that blows my mind. And we've got these high schools that have really great arts programs, not just Walkerville, which is, you know, the arts high school, but like Massey and so forth. There are other great high school programs in the arts. Then we've got St. Clair College. We've got the University of Windsor. And we've got great art programs there. So we've got all this wonderful education for kids to grow up and become artists. And then they grow up and most of them find out there's nothing for me here. I've got to leave. And they do. A lot of them come back, but they're not coming back because they're coming back for the artistic opportunities in Windsor most of the time. They're coming back because they, they had to give up elsewhere because, you know, of expenses and other things. That, I think, is really tragic. It's tragic that we prepare people so well, and then we don't support the arts industry locally in a way that would keep them here. So part of what our long-term goal is with Upstage and the other projects we have in the works in the years to come is to attract investment in, in Windsor's arts scene for all the arts. But, you know, obviously in this case, we're specifically focusing on film, TV, theater, performing arts, I suppose, to get people in Windsor to realize that this isn't, the arts is an industry and that Windsor already has the foundations of a great arts industry. It has the talent, mm -hmm. but what it lacks is support and infrastructure. And we're happy to provide that support and infrastructure to other industries, other kinds of businesses, many of which would not be profitable if they didn't have subsidies and uh, tax breaks and handouts from <clears throat> GM. Oh, no. So, um, <laughs> but, but we don't do it with the arts industries, which I find bizarre. So let's get Windsor, people from Windsor investing in this series so that People make money that can then be invested in the local economy that we can attract. Let's attract investors from around the world and let's use that to grow um, the local economy. The more money we bring in, the more we can circulate and invest in other projects and keep attracting more and investing more. Build the arts industry so that kids have reasons to stay. Mm -hmm. But more than that, so that artists from other places say, you know what, Windsor's a good place to live. And they move here as well. We can grow this arts industry into something incredible. And that benefits a whole lot of other industries. And on top of that, we can grow the arts tourism industry here. The potential of that, and, you know, and Glenn and Sue from Run Runners have been really thinking hard about this too. Um, they've been doing some good work. There's such potential here. We forget, for instance, we treat things like Stratford and Broadway and Hollywood and the West End and London as though they just sprung up out of the air as some sort of miracle. Stratford a few decades ago wasn't Stratford that we know in Ontario. It was not, you know, the place to go for, you know, corporate theater in the province. It wasn't, you know, the big arts tourism place um, for theater lovers and dance lovers and so forth in Ontario. It didn't start that way. Mm. It was a series of choices and investments by various kinds of leaders, arts leaders, business leaders, and governments. And there's nothing stopping Windsor from becoming its own kind of arts hub, except the will of the people and very much so the will of city council. This is an ongoing issue with the, the city of Windsor. has always been, how do you separate the ability to support businesses from a BIA standpoint to supporting the arts as well and including them in the business. We're so a business. Yeah. That's exactly how is you treat the arts as a business. Which it is. Yes. And and in Windsor, we do talk about them as separate things, which I find as an outsider very strange. I find it really odd that people talk about business and then the arts. And when they talk about the arts, they talk about it as leisure. <laughs> the arts is work, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> music and graphic design, like include all of the arts in this and integrate into how you think about restaurants and bars and hotels and every other kind of business. That's what we are too. Yeah, we're, we're, we're a for-profit business. Thing. 
Yeah. And, you know, we exist to bring in enough money to keep creating cool things and paying people. That's why we're here, right? And now we'd like to pay people more. That requires living some, wage. That'd be great. That requires some support, right? The same kind of support that's given to other industries. It's not a handout. It's exactly what's done for industries that we don't speak of as separate from business. Yeah. <laughs> and I just want to say too, because we absolutely do not want to disrespect and never have, like there are three types. There's like community theater, corporate theater, independent regional, which falls in the middle. Community theater. That's also, its own beast. That's man. its own beast. Yeah. And also though, they are a business too. People run community theaters and it's a place that people can go and they can well learn to perform. And there's it's like professional training on some level. If you have the mm -hmm. drive to continue, or if you're just somebody who wants to be in a play and work on a play and kind of do that as just a part of a larger life, cool. Yeah. And they can and they can put on great productions. Amazing. That, productions. Right? But the community theater model is a nonprofit model. It's a model that uses volunteer labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is an actual developed model that was created in the US yeah. and it's credited with keeping theater alive for most of the 20th Absolutely. century. Absolutely. Uh, it's important, but it's different. And and Windsor has a history of treating theater as though that were the only thing. Right. But also treating it that way while also looking at community theater as something that everyone involved is doing just for fun when it it is yes but it also takes a lot of work when you're talking about the organizers and leaders and what windsor has are arts industry leaders raring to go working so hard who are driven who are organized who lack support and infrastructure yeah and we're just part of that we're you know? a tiny part of a much larger scene and the scene is so enormous actually here's a sense of how enormous the art scene is in windsor so we got all of these auditions in the first round for upstaged which was via self-tape and we didn't know 60 percent, 65 percent of the people who auditioned and we've been working in the arts here for years and there's still so many people we had never met before, right? And you're working on, uh, in the arts, you're working, you work on film and so forth. We hadn't met you until okay. recently, right? We didn't know about this podcast. Yeah. That's awesome. It, and now we do. And now we follow you. Yeah. And those connections are so important. Um, that's horrible promotion on my part, so I apologize. You know, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is, but... No one thinks less of you. <laughs> no, okay. We're getting into the area of support. We're getting into the area of funding. Kickstarter campaigns, if you've never run one, are like a second or third job. Talk about this particular Kickstarter campaign. How are you getting the word out? What's your promotions like? How are you trying to reach the masses that are not just local? How are you reaching that international audience that I think would really benefit this particular series? Because we're artists in Canada, um, we've never had fewer than two jobs. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's pretty normal for us. I mean, we both have other jobs uh, in addition to post-productions even. So last month we were kind of working three jobs. You know, that doesn't scare us. But we also spent three weeks planning this. I mean, three years, sorry, planning this. A lot of our decisions, a lot of the organization and the strategy had been sort of figured out before we started organizing the Kickstarter. What I like about the crowdfunding model is that it gives people a chance to become literally invested in something. They've contributed money to it. They've actually shown their trust and confidence in the product. And now that they've contributed money to it, they care about it. They want it to succeed. They want the final thing to, to happen and to be delivered and so forth. And I really like that. There's something that really appeals to me about that more than coming at people with a product finished already and hoping that they're going to care. So I like the crowdfunding model for that. And it also enables us to reach uh, an audience beyond Windsor, which was important to us because if part of what we want to do is showcase Windsor to the world, we have to we have to expand beyond Windsor for our audience. Otherwise, we're just saying to Windsor, here, this is you. And they know that. It gives us an opportunity to get investment from the people of Windsor, Essex in their own arts industry and their own neighbors, their fellow citizens and so forth. But most importantly for me at this point is to convince people from other places 
that Windsor is worth investing in? Because I think it is. A lot of our promotional strategy focuses on that and identifying some target demos um, that might be responsive to that and so forth. As an, one example, one of our demographics is, I don't think our, our biggest target, but it's definitely a, a target demo, is people who work in theater and love theater. We started 15 months ago, I think, putting together a database that includes contact information for every theater company and venue that we could find in the English speaking world. So Canada, the United States, UK, Ireland, New Zealand, Australia. We've started connecting with them through social media and we're going to be writing to them, I guess, throughout this weekend. Yeah. Uh, there are thousands, Ooh. thousands. And these are people who care about theater. These are people who have networks of actors and crew members of various kinds, technicians, all sorts of different kinds of artists plus patrons who already care about theater and are invested in theater. And we're gonna give them something funny where we they can laugh at themselves with us, right? Because we're laughing at ourselves when we wrote it. That's one of the ways that we're trying to reach a broader audience. Our social media coordinators have been doing a really good job of coming up with strategies to get upstaged trending uh, in various places and to call more attention to the Kickstarter that way. The more we can get people to, first of all, know that it exists and then feel like this is something I actually care enough about to throw even 20 bucks at or something like that. You know, if we can reach an audience, an international audience that ends up caring about this, that ends up learning about Windsor, that ends up investing money in the Windsor arts scene, and that maybe becomes curious about visiting Windsor someday. And we can showcase the local talents behind the camera and in front of the camera. We'll have accomplished pretty much all the goals I set up for. We'd like to make money off of this. Absolutely. Again, we're a business. But at minimum, we just don't want to lose money. Yeah. And we want to um, make sure that the people who work on it get paid. And also, we trash talk exposure all the time. Exposure is <laughs> not a bad thing. It's a bad thing on its own, right? So if we can get people paid and get them exposure, all the better, right? So if you look at even just the one little demo among our, our target demos, people who work in and love theater, and if we can get... 1%, actually half a percent of the people in those networks and the contacts from our database to contribute 20 bucks to the Kickstarter, we will vastly exceed our target. If I may, just because I've been doing a lot of the following and the liking and the researching of all of these companies, some have already began to follow us back. We're approaching this in a very personal level because just like in our local industry, we're all part of this wider industry of people who work in this performing arts, in this yeah. field. Thank you, yeah. field. So I already know, like I'm making a list in my head of all of these different companies that I, I already want to go to around mm -hmm. the world. Like I already knew I want to go to the Royal Court one day. One day I'm going to see a show there. But all of these little companies are springing up. There's somebody doing Jerusalem by Jez Butterworth right one of our now. favorite well, bucket list places. And if I had the money and the time, which right now I don't, but one day, one day I will. Yeah, I would go in a heartbeat. We want to do that too, is make those connections because they're so important. You see my show, I see your show. And that yeah. sense that we're all in this together, even yeah. if we live in, you know, Auckland. What they're doing is what we're doing. Passionate people working long hours to create something out of nothing in the hopes of entertaining other people. To share stories, to love and share stories. Like one of our goals, this is grossly off topic, but eventually we are going to have a publishing branch where we publish the original plays that we've produced here so that they can be produced and enjoyed on a larger scale. I would love to see something that we wrote together, another fucking Christmas play, a fucking musical. My dream is to see that done somewhere else by people who don't know who we are. <laughs> wow, what they could do with it. Just, it's been really fulfilling on a personal level. It's important. And I also feel like we're jumping on board of something that already exists. We just need to reach our sights wider, you know? It's easy when you're talking about a comic or a book from a media perspective, but when it comes to a series like this, especially a 
as hyper local as it is in winter. What are we expecting? Are we going to see the streaming DVDs? What perks are we looking forward to to supporting this amazing series on? Let's start with Tipster Loon, a fairly low support. It's a pocket change kind of a thing. It's like if you were going to go to Tim Hortons, maybe you throw 15 bucks in here instead. On all of our social media, you get that shout out and recognition. Plus, access to backers-only content, which is being created as we go. It's going to include things like interviews with casts, behind-the-scenes, blooper reels. Are they going to be included on the DVD later? We Some of them, yeah. Some. The good ones. The really good ones. But you get content to the behind-the-scenes of the behind-the-scenes for your interest in entertainment. Next level, the Goose Buddy gets you all of that same stuff, but now you also get your name in the credits. You have a little bit of bragging rights there when the series releases. You can point that out and be like, me, now in a credit. <laughs> but the Bison Hoser, probably my favorite of the drawings. Look at that guy. You get all of those same things, plus digital access to all eight episodes when it releases. So you're buying the series early. When the series is released for download and streaming, it will be $25 for all eight episodes. So you're purchasing that, you're pre-purchasing that, and then you get the other perks as well. Moving on to the Picky Beaver. It's picky because you get a choice. You get all of those things that we've already mentioned, plus your choice of either a bound copy of all scripts for all eight episodes signed by the cast. So you get that little keepsake that may be worth a pretty penny on eBay one day. Or or you get an original limited edition signed poster created by our graphic artist, Chris Simic, for the series also signed by the entire cast and crew. So little keepsakes to hang on your wall. Now the gluttonous beaver, also very proud of that little guy, you get all of that. So you get both the bound copies of the scripts and the limited edition poster. And we will ship these things all across the world, have arranged for that. Plus everything else I already mentioned. Now getting up to the associate moose. Now the associate moose, you get everything that I've already mentioned. And now we get into producer credits. You're credited as an associate producer on all eight episodes. You get your IMDb listing as associate producer of Upstaged. You can submit a question to be answered via video on all of our social medias. Oh, we also give you a t-shirt, an official associate producer t-shirt that you can wear with pride and dignity. You'll have that moose on it. And it'll have the moose on it and you get bragging rights. So you can walk around and be all cool with that. Finally, Visionary Grizzly gets you all of those things, except rather than associate producer, you get a visionary producer t-shirt and your IMDb credit as producer on the series. And in all eight episodes, you can submit a question to be answered via our, our social media. You also get a 20 minute video chat with the creators and whatever members of the cast and crew we can rustle up for you. <laughs> if you have someone in particular you wanna to talk to, we'll get them there for you. As well as an invitation to the upstaged rap party, which will be happening August or September. Details to be announced, but you also get to schmooze. And we will be releasing more information and photos and stuff about that as they come along, as we are creating them. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, oh I like that. Um, mm. The first time somebody told me I wasn't funny in grade school, I was making my friend laugh. She was my friend. She thought I was funny. I was a very awkward child and a boy who, you know, when you think back, maybe had a crush on me and didn't know what to do other than punch my arm and, and tease me and pull my hair. Maybe he just didn't like me, but he said, you're not funny. And I still think about that because it somehow physically hurt me. I was very young. I've kind of strived to prove him wrong my entire life since then. That like, well, I think I'm funny and I make other people laugh. But something about that hurt me because I knew, you know, I wasn't, and because, you know, I grew up here, I knew I wasn't pretty and I wasn't smart, you know, but I was funny. And that words could take that away from me, even for a little while. You're smart, pretty, and funny. I love you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know what, for me, I have very early memories of realizing that, realizing that people had power over me because they could read. And I hated it. And I hated being read to as a child, hated the fact that they had access to this power that I didn't. 
So I taught myself to read when I was four. And basically from that point on, wouldn't let people read to me and then devoured everything I could uh, until I went blind. And now people have to read things to me all the time. So it <laughs> didn't work out in the long run, but for a few decades, I had a good run. I, I mean, that's what audiobooks are for, right? So <laughs> audiobook quality is pretty nice now. <laughs> Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Second. Oh, hmm. Surround yourself with people who are better than you and learn from them. Mine, this is a big cliche for people in the theater communities. There are no small parts, only small actors. Now let's widen that. It's such a cliche, but listen, this is true across the board that you're not better than scrubbing a toilet. I don't care who you are. You're not better than any menial job that needs doing. Kind of be humble, be willing to lend a hand, but don't let others demean you. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My mother is one of the most surprising people I've ever known because I've seen her and I still see her continually change and keep herself open, be accepting of others. And that has been a huge inspiration, as well as her ability to keep it together. Hmm. Yeah, mine's not going to be nearly as heartwarming. Uh, Shouldn't have gone first. So I'm an academic, and I was kind of forced to be an academic against my will. I hate school. I've always hated school. I hated it from kindergarten onward. <laughs> and I teach now, and I still hate school. But um <laughs> Early on in my studies, I came across a philosopher named Bertrand Russell, lived almost 98 years. His life spanned the Victorian period, the Edwardian period, you know, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, both world wars, the Korean War, the invention of nuclear power and atomic bombs, all the way through up to the Vietnam War and the moon landing. So he lived through like everything. And he was an academic. He was a mathematician and a philosopher, but never distanced himself from the world. He was always a part of the world. He did that in all sorts of different ways. One of them was by being involved in, in causes that he thought were important. He was thrown in jail twice, once when during World War I for distributing anti-war propaganda. And then the other time he was in his 90s for protesting the Vietnam War. He was fired from many jobs because he was involved in things or advocating things like rights for women and uh, access to birth control and about making connections with human beings and finding ways to work against our tendency to split off into groups and turn people into other. The idea of somebody who could be both an academic but also involved in the world and also involved in the arts was a huge inspiration to me and made me feel less uncomfortable and resentful about being in academia. And one of his slogans that has stayed with me my whole life, use it a lot, is remember your humanity and forget the rest. Also, Charlie Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> For writing abstract ideas in particular ways. From a professional standpoint, you are both successful in regards to running a business in Windsor, Essex County, especially when it comes to the theater productions that you're doing. I'm sure you'll be successful with this particular campaign as well. So from a professional standpoint, you are a success. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Can I just say that depends how you define success. I think I'm still, I'm still striving to succeed. And maybe... What does that mean? What are you striving for? I'm striving, I don't know, to have a good night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and that then that will never happen as long as I still feel like there's something else that can be accomplished. So that's a very hard question to answer for me because I think I have had accomplishments. Absolutely, I've accomplished more in my life than I would have ever thought possible. And yet, 
And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for it to never be enough, not to burn yourself out or to put an expectation upon yourself that is unachievable. I think, I think I'm still striving for something, something more. I would say every time I've, I've achieved anything that other people would consider a kind of success, whether it's, you know, a professional kind of success or a personal kind of success, but I'll focus on the personal, obviously. I've realized that I didn't consider it a success. Usually it's just something I thought was my responsibility. So, you know, it's just something I was supposed to do anyway, or I had to do anyway. I think like Faye, I'm still striving to understand what I would consider a success mm -hmm. and that I haven't found it yet, but it hasn't stopped me from experimenting and trying things out to see if I can find it somewhere. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, the great, that's a great follow-up. I love failure. <laughs> I love it. I love failure. I've, I've, I am in love with failure. I think failure is one of the most important things in the world. It's one of the most important things we can experience. Um, you know, I spend a, a lot of my day job advising teachers uh, on what, how, how to improve and how to, uh, to teach and assess better and design better courses and things. And, and I always tell them fail often and fail early. That includes themselves, but also their students, because that's where you learn. Nothing is as, I think, poisonous to learning and growth and development as conventional success, what people normally consider success. I think we need failure. The trick to making failure, to seeing failure as a good and making it work for you is just the attitude that you take toward it. And uh, if you're the sort of person who's in the kind of position where you can engineer failure for others, like a teacher, it's providing the support that people will need to learn from it and make progress rather than just failing people and letting them wallow. Looking back, I've had a lot of great failures and really horrible experiences, difficult experiences that were very painful at the time. Those are, I think, all my most important life experiences. And being with this guy has taught me a lot about failure and the importance. I of, fail all the time. Because you can fail often and fail, fail early and fail often. But I've gotten to this point in my life, and I view failure the same way, that it is, I don't want to say character building, um, but it does. It forces you to think, okay, that didn't work. So then what? So now what? And because we are theater producers, you don't have a choice. You cannot fail. Once you've decided to open a production and you have people counting on you as a producer, as a business owner, as um, anybody in leadership, if you fail, others fail. So you can fail on a personal level, but you have no choice but to accomplish what you set out to do on some level. Mm -hmm. And I think that everything we've done and everything we've failed at and succeeded at and have been able to accomplish is what is going to make this series happen. Yeah. 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 And I can say yeah. one thing that we both agree on too, is that we both prefer ambitious failures to mediocre successes yeah i will go to any lengths to avoid mediocrity um even if it risks <laughs> my my personal well-being or say um homelessness i will go to any length to avoid mediocrity also i beat myself up about it <laughs> <laughs> we're not healthy people no <laughs> i've had some people say hookers and blow but that's beside the point so. <laughs> I didn't even think to say hookers and blow. I changed my answer. We weren't getting that specific. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the after hour show, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Out of van and alcohol. <laughs> the young generation is looking at your works and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's maybe in theater or writing a, their own series or something in creative in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you're both inspiring them down that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? It terrifies me to think of myself as any kind of role model. When, when I realized 
that I'm an older generation in the industry I'm in and the up and comings at the age I was at when I was coming up, um, on some level, it absolutely terrifies me. <laughs> if I were to give, you know, young artists, people starting out any kind of advice, and mostly I think people shouldn't take my advice, but, <laughs> but this one I think I'm okay with is you're your first audience. So create something that you care about, that you find um, exciting or funny or interesting, whatever it is that, that you're aiming for, create it for you first. And then the people who share your tastes will find it eventually, but never create for other people. Yeah. You end up pandering and creating something that is usually awful and at best mediocre and mediocre is just the kind of awful we're used to that's good advice um <laughs> i i don't know if this is the right term for it but be pro-social uh don't be a dick yeah don't be a uh, dick to anybody because i have not cast someone based on attitude alone they could be the best actor in the room but if you come in with an attitude or an ego a bias or if, if you come in like a bully no one will work with you your talent means nothing if as a person you are a dick yeah 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 agreed, agreed. yeah will we had it right. yeah man he did <laughs> if your life was a theater production what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Ooh. <laughs> uh, I already know the title of mine. Okay. Living in Shadows. Ooh. Yeah, because I was uh, the younger of two siblings and my brother had a much larger personality than me. Uh, I was known as his sister for a long portion. I run the shadow box theater. I do a lot of backstage work. My position in life has often been to scurry around and clean up messes and try and pick up trip hazards before anyone trips. So living in shadows, let me think of my soundtrack. What would yours be? Hmm. Okay. This is a tough one. That's a good um, one. Yeah. These are good questions, Kurt. Okay. The title of the play about my life would be from trailer trash to Dollarama cyborg. And, um, and the, <laughs> the, the soundtrack, or at least the, the theme song would be um, the heart's filthy lesson by David Bowie. Hmm. You know what? No, I'm going for it because it's, it's in my heart. Uh, Fast Car, Tracy Chapman. Do you know that song? I There was a day where I would just sob listening to it. And she, she doesn't want much. She, she just wants a little bit of a better life. A little taste. Of something. <laughs> um, and I just, I it was the first thing that popped in my head. And so that's that's exactly what I'll go with. I like that. That's pretty good. Tracy Chapman. Oh, my God. Ultimate title for mine, You Can Never Have Too Many Pills. Nice. Okay. <laughs> well, I do hate to say this, Michael and Faye, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Very excellent interview. Excellent questions. Great talking with you. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate it. Before I let you both go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this amazing Kickstarter campaign? When does it end? And anything else you would like to promote? You can access it through our website, which is upstagedseries.com. Correct. As well, you can find bios of all the cast members and production team members, creators, lots of info, links to media coverage and things like that. Links to all of our socials, our partners, yeah. and all of that can be found on that webpage. Oh, you know, I can tell you this, too, um, that we have just partnered with the Windsor Zach Center Nick. for Film, Digital Media and Arts. A full partner with Upstage now, and they're putting it together with us. So. Shout out to Amanda Gelman yeah. and the incredible work that the Windsor Film Center does. Yeah. Just incredible astounding stuff. stuff. Best thing you can do to support us. Go to upstageseries.com, click on the Kickstarter button and contribute what you can and encourage other people to contribute as well so that we can employ all these artists and invest in more employment for artists and create more seasons of the series because we had a blast writing it. I think we're going to have a blast filming it and we'd like to keep going. Kickstarter starts May 10th. It lasts 30 days. I think that brings us to like June 8th or 9th. We didn't do the math.
Let's say the eight. <laughs> <laughs> that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O. Website is going through a complete rebuild. So go to our YouTube channel. That's always updated because I am only one person. Give me a break. <laughs> It's youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Cast is back. You can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.